Welcome to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And today we enter episode six of our series, Humanity of Prologue. This one is called Peking Man. <laughs> Play on words because we're going to talk about the erectine grade hominins. So Homo erectus and company. Uh, but before we jump into that, Albert, how have you been, buddy? Pretty good. Uh, so I'm uh a little busy but uh, it's kind of kind of the last uh i got a brief burst of uh, kind of things i need to get to uh, for for this year uh so uh this week uh, and it, it, which is um still ongoing is the uh, paleontological association conference which is kind of the big um paleontological conference uh in europe which happens annually um mm -hmm. Of course, it is happening online given current circumstances, and uh, you know it's it's a it's quite a quite a diverse uh, range of presentations that are on on display here, um, because uh, unlike the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology uh, conference, uh, the Paleontological Association conference is um, attended by all kinds of paleontologists and not just vertebrate paleontologists. So there are a lot of talks on. Um, you know, invertebrate paleontology on micro fossils on uh, plants, even uh, so, definitely very varied. I've kind of been jumping in and out of the sessions, mostly checking out the the ones uh, that I that are more topical to my research as well as um, uh, talks by friends. Uh, yeah, that's always a nice thing to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, I I think uh, the Palace Conference, as it's called for short, is uh, I, I think the main draw of it for me is uh, you know. Not not that all the presentations are especially relevant or of special interest to me, but um, uh, mostly just so I have a chance to, to meet up with some of my friends who don't study vertebrate paleontology. Uh, so that that's always nice. Oh, excellent! And so that that's like as we're speaking, it's going on right now. Yeah, well, well, may, maybe not strictly right now because uh, it, it's currently the the evening here, and so they they don't have any events uh, going on at the very this very moment. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's happening through these. Uh, the past couple of days and it'll continue tomorrow oh excellent well that's so good to hear yeah yeah i know uh... oh yeah go go on <laughs> i was gonna say uh, speaking of, of conferences mm -hmm. i mean we also had our uh our exciting conference last saturday huh? yeah that's right i was there too <laughs> Ted Zoo Con, or should i say Ted Zoom Con? <laughs> oh my gosh where do i even start um well again this, this was my first Tet ZooCon of any kind, and I, I most fun I've had in in a little while. Mm -hmm. Like I'm sort of in the same boat as you. Like just well, seeing all these people that I know and follow on you know, on the internet, and as well as like close friends of mine, um, was a real treat. And then meeting some new faces, new mm -hmm. friends, um, getting into like amazing conversations. So of course, like the whole the whole structure of the conference was like fourfold you had like the main talks at the beginning of various topics um i thought the neanderthal one and the pterosaur one was probably those were probably my favorites mm -hmm. i think but everybody does a fantastic job there um and then of course there was the the abc or the alien big cat that was uh, interesting yeah yeah the session there which uh i know it's a very niche topic and and it was of discourse in the chat regarding whether it was a worthwhile endeavor or not mm -hmm. but i mean for me like with pet zoo like cryptids and mystery animals and 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 that sort of stuff it, it's part of it yeah it's, totally I take it along with the you know the paleo and the zoology and so forth so i, I don't mind it all that mm -hmm. much yeah. i'm not like that particular like field does not like make me jump up and down but it's still fairly interesting and yeah um, I thought it was really interesting what they had to say regarding the evidence, as it seems, I guess, that, you know, compared to things like, you know, lake monsters or Bigfoot, mm -hmm. like, this seems to be, like, a legitimate thing that is, like, worth looking into deeper. Right, you know, right. actually are cats of large size, not necessarily panthers, mm -hmm. but, like, of significant size that are, you know, killing livestock and deer and, and roaming the British countryside. Right. So I, I thought that was particularly cool. Um, then, of course, there was the art session, the paleo art session, which mm -hmm. was 
you know, smorgasbord of all the great paleo artists of the current time and, and then some, <laughs> which was a, a real treat. Um, I don't know about you, Albert, but I was in David Prince's session where oh, he cool. kind of gave a, a ZBrush tutorial on, on how to use it and how easy it is to kind of like figure out the, the tools to like sculpt a dinosaur, which is what he did. He made like a little, like a little Gumby theropod looking thing. Mm -hmm. How to like use textures and scales and I thought that was really cool. Yeah. That was fun. Which one did you uh, so I, I ended up in uh, Scott Hartman's uh, session, and uh, you know if, if you're into paleo art at all, you're probably familiar with his work. Uh, so he, he is best known for making skeletal reconstructions uh, of you know mostly dinosaurs, but he's he's done other types of uh, um, prehistoric life as well, and, and some modern animals too. Um, and uh, his kind of diagrams are often seen in uh, in papers and such for his illustrations. So, yeah, so he, he, he talked a lot about uh, basically various aspects of um, not necessarily the, uh, doing the skeletal reconstructions themselves, but kind of uh, modifying the, those diagrams. Like he, he showed us how he might uh, repose those diagrams into different, well, poses. Like if he wants to do an animal that is, that is walking versus just standing there. Um, and uh yeah um and and also he mentioned things like um how he draws his um silhouette outlines around the skeleton because that that's something he does with the with the skeletons and it's very uh, very distinctive it's uh, you, you have the you have those bones and uh on top of like a black silhouette of the animal's body outline uh behind it uh so his in his in his um uh, silhouettes they they don't include the skin or uh, the um, um, the fat deposits just b beneath them so he, he describes them as being uh, flayed uh, but they they do include the muscles basically and that and he mentioned that's because it it's a lot easier to you know be a little bit more confident about what muscles were there and how big they were uh, compared to what the skin was like in, in most uh, extinct animals and that that's why he only includes the the soft tissue up to the muscular level essentially in, in those diagrams and he yeah and he and he showed us you know some some of the um some of the process he goes through when he when he's doing when he's making those silhouettes for the for the skeletals so that was fun definitely very informative oh well, that's fantastic yeah, I've always liked his his work. Um, I know like his skeletals are like super informative because like they're so new mm -hmm. and you can, like just go in and update them when necessary. Right. Uh, well, it's awesome to hear. Um, of course, the the uh, the big finale of the whole thing was the after party. Which, <laughs> uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I stayed I stayed up as long as I could for that. Yeah. Um, like it started as dinner time for me usually started mm -hmm. but like i had a fairly big lunch during the the little break session in between That's earlier good. yeah so i was like okay I'll, i'm i'm not hungry now i can hold off as long as i can so hours pass by and then, um, <laughs> all kinds of chatting is going on we're, we're, we're showing our natural history stuff we're showing books and opening different pages You're right and then and catching up and uh, that was particularly fun um I got to chat with John Connolly quite a bit. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That was really nice. Very, very sweet. Um, felt, you feel really welcome during the after Yeah, like totally. Everybody, like, you're all, like, in the same boat. You know, you all are interested in natural history, you know, zoology, paleontology, mm -hmm. you know, speculative zoology, that sort of thing. And so it's just, we're all, like, info dumping to each other. Right, right. It's the best feeling. But, like, yeah. by the time it was, like, 9.30, like I was like nine thirty p.m. for me. Yeah. Like I was, uh, I was starving. Like I had to eat something, and so I, I logged off and uh, said my goodbyes. And oh, I was, I was eating lasagna, and I felt just I felt warm and fuzzy. Like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It went off without a hitch. There were like no technical difficulties. Yes. Yeah. Like everybody who needed to be there, like, came and right. There were no delays. There was no. There were no incidents. Thank goodness. No. Right drama or anything like mm -hmm. that it, it was a good it was a very good saturday it really was it really was like yeah like uh as you as you know i've been to a, a few of the previous tetsukons which happened in person of course and uh you know it 
the the one that happened this past Saturday was not, of course, quite the same as a, as the in-person versions of it, but I think they recaptured the spirit of it very well. Like, yeah, definitely, definitely that whole feeling of, you know, this is just a gathering of people with the shared interest in this, in this subject. Uh, that came across very strongly, I think, uh, throughout the event. And yeah, the the freaking the freaking after party, like, <laughs> uh, so I, I, as you might remember, I I, I logged off a, a little earlier than than you did, because um, of course uh, it it uh, we're I guess uh, it it gets later here quicker, <laughs> well not not quicker but earlier <laughs> uh, due to the due to the time zones, um, and so so I I retired uh, early, but then I and I I actually got a pretty good night's sleep that night, which was <laughs> interesting, uh, but. But yeah, I, I got almost eight hours of sleep, and then I woke up, and then I I I start peeking on Twitter just to see you know if if there's a, anything interesting I missed, and and then, and then I saw that there were still people in the freaking after party chat. Like, <laughs> wow, yeah, but yeah, and, of British folks just keeping it going. Right, right, yeah. Like the the craziest thing was that it wasn't it wasn't even just like oh some people woke up later in in different time zones and kept it going. It was that there were some British people who just stayed up all the way. <laughs> it was like a, it was supposed to be a one day Tetsukon. That was the joke, and it became two days. You're right. <laughs> yeah. It, it was wild, yeah. I, I actually, I actually ended up like rejoining them for a little bit, and it was, it was fun. And we, we did get some people from like uh, the later time zones popping up too. Like uh, R.J. Palmer actually popped in. Uh, he, he, he missed like the earlier portions of the after party, but he showed up at that point, and that was cool. Yeah, yeah. R.J. Palmer is, of course, uh, if you're familiar with like creature design and such, he's a very well-known artist. Uh, he did uh, designs for like Detective Pikachu and. Uh, uh, the Saurian video game and so on, and very very well known for like his realistic interpretations of Pokemon. Oh uh, yeah, that, that's fun stuff. Yeah, and he 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 gave a talk at this past uh, Ted Zoom Con about creature design, which was quite interesting. Um, but yeah, in, in any case, <laughs> yes. So so yeah, I, I actually uh, got, got to hang out a little bit more with the with the kind of final uh, in the kind of the final moments of the the after party uh, and yeah that that went on until like early afternoon british time so <laughs> some okay. some people are pretty uh pretty dedicated <laughs> you know I, I think it's it's fair to say that like you know with covid and everything mm -hmm. you know we're all just kind of stuck in our little pockets of the world mm -hmm. trying to do our best to stay healthy right like we're, we're starved for that sort of like attention and companionship mm. and, and just hanging out, you know? Right. So I, I don't blame folks for just keeping it going. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> and Pat, I mean, based on what Darren Nash has had to say, you know, about the success of this con, I'm getting vibes that maybe this will not only be a thing in the future, but like, a more regularly occurring thing like this might be like maybe a multi-month out of the year sort of thing than just you know one day out of the year right you know yeah I mean? yeah i'm i'm getting those vibes from him too it, it seems like he's at least thinking about it so yeah fingers crossed because you know if they all go like this one did I, they will be excellent <laughs> yeah I, I i i'd love to go back again absolutely there's still more folks to catch up with couldn't even totally couldn't even get to talk to everything that i wanted to no yeah, no but... not yeah that was impossible at all <laughs> oh, no, I mean, like, like 350 plus folks yeah no you're right <laughs> right <laughs> but no it was great and uh i guess just to kind of wrap up here um of course if you went to tetsukon if you're listening like i i believe we're going to be owed like a recording of the whole thing at a certain time in the future mm -hmm. they, they, they gotta you know, get all that together of course right take as much time as they need to goodness gracious they, they pulled this off brilliantly yeah um, mm -hmm. but if you didn't get to go to tetsukon and you are still curious about all the talks and, and, and the, the the big cat session and everything then i believe like for a small fee you'll be able to purchase that mm -hmm. get some support and get to enjoy some of the the, the content that we got to experience live. Right. So that's, that's, yeah, that was great. 
great Saturday. Totally. Um, but in any case, you know, we, we are, uh, we are about roughly halfway through this series. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we're going to be reaching the direct origins of Homo sapiens very soon. Um, but you know, before we get back to the main narrative, uh, I would like to address something regarding the, the previous episode. Hmm. So we can now, uh, jump to the next slide here. Yep. Now, uh, when I was discussing collective learning, you know, I, I made some very broad statements about human and non-human primate behavior. Uh, I referenced a, a number of studies as a collective that suggested that chimps and other non-human apes uh, lack empathy of a human sort. Mm. That they're they're good at working together to solve problems, that they, they have a sense of fairness, but they're not so good at recognizing when another ape needs help based on visual cues and you know that this was in contrast to humans who were supposed to excel at this form of empathy you hmm. know, which made us unique in, in this aspect well you know when it when it comes to preparing for the series you know I, I really try my best to collect together as many resources current resources as i can and, and summarize it all for you um you know and in regards to paleoanthropology there is just so much to unpack <laughs> that you know one person alone is going to have a, a great deal of difficulty doing so mm-hmm, right like this is hardcore work for me so uh, i'm really trying you know and i i do apologize in advance and and right now you know if if i come underprepared when it comes to certain subjects in the field mm-hmm. like, like climate behavior um there is a great deal of discourse when you try to compare humans to other primates in this way and you're trying to see how it relates to the story of our evolution you, know, you got some anthropologists who argue strongly that you know we have a lot to learn about ourselves by looking at our relatives and you have some who argue just as fairly that because our relatives have gone through as much evolution as we have we shouldn't really try to make these comparisons at all mm. um as, as far as my stance goes, and, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm not a practicing primatologist, so uh, I'm obliged to state that, you know, you're welcome to ignore this. Um, <laughs> I, I think as long as, you know, there's good data and sound research being involved, and if the scientists concerned are upfront about any uncertainties, I think there's some validity in comparing human behaviors to that of other primates to mm. learn at least something about our origins, uh, I don't know about you, Albert. Yeah, well, I, I'm not a primatologist either, but uh, I I would agree. Um, you know, um, as um, I guess I, I guess I, I could be considered an evolutionary biologist working on other groups of animals. You know, phylogeny has an effect on like pretty much every aspect of, of biology. So uh, I do think uh, we have to be careful not to um, assume too much. Like we we shouldn't assume like say uh, the other primates are representing like. Uh, ancestral behaviors uh, for for uh, our lineage or anything like that but um uh, i do think that they they can inform us about uh kind of the origins of our behavior and of our current uh, kind of uh, the current nature of our our behaviors and other aspects of our evolution um so yeah I, in in essence i guess I, I would agree with you there right well, I mean, with all that said, you know, I was, you know, as I was working on this episode, I was alerted to a, uh, an old 2013 interview uh, by a world-famous ethologist who studies animal behavior, Franz De Waal. Mm-hmm. I'm sure some of you might be familiar with him. Um, this was used in conjunction for another article that was kind of promoting his most recent book, uh, which is called uh, Mama's Last Hug, Animal Emotions and What They Tell Us About Ourselves. You can see the... Uh, the cover here on the right Uh, for those of you who might remember this there was a a viral video from a few years ago Mm. uh, regarding two individuals so the biologist uh jean van hoff and uh mama who was a 59 year old chimpanzee who lived at the the burger zoo in the netherlands now uh, 59 for a chimp that's a pretty ripe old age Mm -hmm. Um, the max in captivity is 66 Hmm. while in the wild that's about 60 so mama was very frail and had already grown quite ill by the time the video was taken um in fact she actually passed away 
very soon after the video was you know released mm -hmm. so you know she was on her way out um so the, the, the video is basically a a reunion between the two you know van hoff had cared for her for many years and hadn't seen her for a while and if you look at the video which we'll put in the description of course you know it, it looks like mama not only recognized him but also seemed thrilled you know she she's mm -hmm. reaching over his back with her arm and kind of patting his hair gently petting his head um he's just just embracing him and just showing all the signs of you know compassion for another individual mm -hmm. just based on a visual cue you know she yeah. she sees him and she's like hey it's okay I, I you can come and say hello and it seems she was very very thrilled um you know again like compassion for another individual you know i i stated that in the previous episode you know it was supposed to be one of those things that later hominins were more likely to do than say related lineages like chimps um, you know france the wall had been arguing for many decades that humans align so closely with other primates in regards to social and emotional qualities that the only thing that we can justifiably single out among all of that is language mm. you know uh, a lot of the studies on chimps and other apes, they seem to show that they lack human-like empathy, but they've actually been contested hmm. by other research that has revealed a lot of very suspiciously and perhaps stereotypically human traits. Hmm. Uh, you have cases of young chimpanzees recognizing when an elderly individual is having trouble moving towards a source of water, and so they'll actually run ahead to the water, scoop up a bunch in their mouth, and then go over to the slow-moving elderly chimp and then just give them a drink so they didn't have to move very much. Um, you have instances that demonstrate uh, the chimpanzees have an empathetic understanding of community, you know, that a group does much better when conflict is limited. And, you know, like they actually understand that should a fight break out, it's not a good idea to send in a male to stop it because, you know, he might be seen as an ally of the neighboring aggressor mm -hmm. since it's chimpanzee societies you know the males are usually the ones muscling their way around and so they actually send females in to end the fights and they'll even go as far as to like pull sticks and rocks out of the fighters hands and then drag them both together <laughs> in like a sort of reconciliation spot so they can <laughs> groom and, and and make up wow and it does the trick it, it, it's incredibly remarkable um so i i, I want to quote from this interview from from franz the wall Humans overestimate the complexity of empathy. If you tell the average psychologist there's empathy in animals, they will say that's not possible. They think empathy means you consciously put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. We know from human research that there's a lot of empathy in automatic responses. If I'm frowning and looking sad, you're going to frown and look sad because you will be affected by my facial emotions. If I'm laughing and smiling, you're going to laugh and smile. That bodily connection, usually called emotional contagion, is easily demonstrable in lots of animals. Uh, we do research on yawning contagion in chimpanzees. If I'm yawning, you're going to yawn at some point. We know that human studies that it's correlated to empathy. People who are very empathetic are also very sensitive to the yawns of others, and they're more likely to yawn in response to the yawns of someone they're close to. So we tested chimpanzees. We showed them videotapes of yawning chimpanzees, and they started yawning. They actually do it more if they see it in an individual they know, just like in humans. These bodily connections are basically how empathy starts. And so you, just to end here, you, when it comes to aspects like empathy or compassion, you know, we're, we're probably not as special as we might think in that regard. You know, the foundations of the behaviors that led to, say, that group of Homo georgicus taking care of their toothless elderly companion all the way up to blood donations and food banks and universal health care, you know, mm -hmm. those were most likely already in place very deep in our history right. before we were even hominins. So, yeah, I, I really I really should do a better job of exploring this field and then presenting that evidence to you all. So uh, I apologize for that. Um, but, uh, Albert, uh, do you have anything else to, to kind of add there? Um. No, I, I think I was quite quite well explained. Uh, that, that definitely uh, it it is um, it is very true that we have a historically a strongly underestimated, you know, the um, 
mental capacities and complexity of um, non-human animals in general. Uh, and definitely uh, that would seem to be especially true with the uh, species that are closely related to us. We, we probably should expect, uh, you know, some degree of similarity to, to how their uh, social and mental uh, structures function. So, yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, definitely. Well, hey, let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide, shall we? Sure thing. Let's go ahead and, and jump right in. So, uh, when we last left the hominin story, you know, the genus Homo had emerged in Africa by 2.8 million years ago, and uh, they further diversified and expanded their range across the Afro-Eurasian landmass, as it's called, so sending our lineage as far east as Indonesia and the Philippines. You know, we had thinned our fur, we expanded our brow ridge, you know, we began to make a a larger impact on the environment. You know, so when we reached our next evolutionary grade around 2 million years ago, these trends and more only accelerated. So for this series, I call this grade the Erectines, mm. after one of the first known extinct hominins in human history. This was described in the 1890s. This is Homo erectus, which was hailed as a missing link mm. between us and the apes. And of course, I, I don't think I need to explain that the term missing link doesn't really mean anything tangible. <laughs> You're right. You know, it's never used in contemporary evolutionary sciences. You know, we, if anything, we have, if we have missing links, you know, that we have a serious problem. You know, what, what the heck are all these hominins that we've been looking at for the past <laughs> several episodes, right? Um, so for, uh, for this part of the family tree, we see a noticeable increase in body size, for one. You know, this is the first time that we get hominins that sprout into the 1.83 meter range. So they, they, they break wow. the six foot barrier. <laughs> right. <laughs> getting, getting taller. Yep. Um, and, and cranial capacity has grown tremendously, too. Uh, we've now expanded into the thousand cubic centimeter range and beyond. You know, we've reached a point where the length of hominin childhood approaches the sort that we experience today. So taking about 24 years to reach full sexual maturity. Uh, which is much more time to gain knowledge and understanding about the world. And all of this, of course, is tied to a greater reliance on more open environment for our livelihoods. We start seeing more and more evidence of human activity in the savannas and in other grasslands, you know, beyond the sort of open woodlands that characterize the earlier lineages for the most part. You know, just to get kind of a preview of what we're going to talk about today, as far as technological developments go, um, in erectines, we find not only new stone tool technologies like the Ashulean, uh, we also find the first shaped bone tools, among other typically perishable materials. Uh, and this is telling of a reliance on a greater variety of foods than is previously known in our lineage. And much of that could now be processed through the use of fire, you know, which there's evidence to suggest that you know, a wider use of fire was broadening and, and bordering on almost domestication of the sort. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and meet the folks. Mm. We'll go to the next slide here. Now, the first of the erectines is a species called Homo ergaster that lived throughout Eastern and Southern Africa from about two to 1.4 million years ago. You know, this is an interesting species, although depending on who you ask, you know, it probably isn't a distinct species mm. at all. So the story begins in the 1970s. We had two anthropologists, Richard Leakey and Alan Walker. They found a number of fossils alongside Lake Turkana in Kenya, and among them were two semi-complete skulls and a fairly well-preserved mandible. The skulls were assigned under Homo erectus, while the mandible was labeled Homo of indeterminate species due to the anatomy. You know, it looked a little bit different from what we had found before, but still recognizable enough to be in the genus Homo. Uh, a little later, we see that that indeterminate mandible was given a distinct name, Homo ergaster, in 1975 by Colin Groves and Bratislav Maziak, who thought it was unique enough to justify the name, while also lumping the other Kenyan fossils into that species. So the, the skulls, for example, were removed from their inclusion under Homo erectus. Now, some years after that, and we see the anthropologist Kamoya Kinyu discovering the skeleton of the Turkana, or Narratatoni, mm in 1984, which is this remarkable specimen of a juvenile aged about seven or 11 years old, but you know, they were already standing 
1.6 meters tall. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the skeleton here on the, on the right. Um, just for comparison, you know, the average 11 year old boy today only gets to about 1.43 meters tall. Mm -hmm. So it makes you wonder what the adults were standing or if, you know, that was just sort of nearing their adult size. Um, you're fairly comparable with us. Mm -hmm. now, uh, Kimu, curiously enough, placed this specimen in Homo erectus. And it was years later that other anthropologists considered it Homo ergaster, where today it remains as the sort of poster child for that species. So what's going on here? Well, I bet you can take a wild guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's our old friend the lumpers versus the splitters. There's a pool of researchers who argue that Homo erectus is a very large and highly diverse collection of humans, encompassing specimens like that are you know like Homo ergaster, but also Homo georgicus. You know, in this case, those two would be considered um, early diverging subspecies at most, alongside the later diverging subspecies, which is Homo erectus proper from East and Southeast Asia. Uh, so, in this case, rather than talk about Homo ergaster, we'd be talking about African Homo erectus. Or like in talking about Homo georgicus, we'd be saying Georgian Homo erectus, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, then we have another pool of researchers who would rather see that all this variation is indicative of separate species through time. You know, as the distinctions and the locations in time are wide enough to warrant this. You know, even if we exclude georgicus and ergaster from erectus, you know, do we find that the later was one of the more long-living species of hominins we know about? You know, so it's highly possible that we're looking at a, a gradual change in body form over hundreds of thousands of years. Of course, in the end, we really should be looking at the phylogenetic studies, like we've been doing here. And they argue for the most part that Homo ergaster and Homo georgicus too are probably best understood as distinct species. Hmm. Now, Homo ergaster itself is quite the derivation from earlier species like Homo habilis, for example. Uh, the brow ridge is much more prominent. Uh, the face is slightly less prognathic than before. Uh, the skull is much wider at the base, uh, you know, so housing a much larger brain, of course. Uh, in terms of the postcranial anatomy, as we'll explain in detail later on, you know, this is a much more upright and slender human than the earlier habilines. And based on the trackways that have been associated with this, we know that it is with Homo ergaster that we finally attain the modern human foot with the strong arches, the toes all aligned, and a firm heel. So let's go ahead and jump to the next slide here and meet mm -hmm. Homo erectus proper, or I guess Homo erectus sensu stricto <laughs> in the jargon speak. Uh, this is literally the original ape man. You know, when the fossils were first unearthed and described, and this is by the anthropologist Eugene Dubois, in 1894, he eventually settled on a genus named Pithecanthropus, which means ape human. Now, of course, with later research, we now recognize that this species is a member of Homo. And so that earlier name has been dropped. Um, but it did hang around for quite a while while it was in use, uh, even after the fact, you know, sort of a sort of a brontosaurus situation mm -hmm. before we recognize that brontosaurus was distinct after all. <laughs> but that's a kind of fun story. Um, Incidentally, I do have a number of old books that refer to it as Pithecanthropus, unironically. Mm -hmm. which is really funny. Now, we have quite a lot of remains of Homo erectus, and a lot more than we can reasonably describe in this series. So for now, I would like to highlight at least the, the two stars of the group, if you will, uh, which are themselves so unique in their respective forms that you know, we, be, we do well to give them subspecies names, and, and people have. So the first to be described were the remains discovered by Eugene Dubois. Uh, these are from Trinil on the island of Java in Indonesia. So this is naturally Java man or Homo erectus erectus. Now at the time, the remains were tantalizing enough. You know, there was a, there was a skull cap complete with a wide brow. Uh, there was a molar tooth. Uh, we had one femur and I put an artwork of these at the top right here so you can see them. Uh, and then we found more fossils since then and so we have a really kind of growing understanding of what you know job and homo erectus were like as we'll see uh, hints later on in the show now uh, 
the second one, which was discovered much later in the 1920s, is Peking man, or Homo erectus pekinensis. Now, these were found and described from the cave site of Zhukudian near Peking, which is nowadays known as Beijing. Mm. I think the spelling changed there at some point in, in the, the European spelling in, in China. And this is by the anthropologist Davidson Black. Now, here we have a similar situation with the Java man. You know, for when these remains were first unearthed, they were given the name Senanthropus pekinensis. Of course, you know, when the relationship to the Java fossil was discovered, the name was changed to the modern one to better reflect it. So it's Homo erectus. Now, the Peking fossils consisted of several partial skulls, a number of teeth, and quite a bit of postcrania, as well as tools. Now, due to a series of unfortunate circumstances regarding the fossils' protection during World War II, all of these were lost mm -hmm. in 1941. Um, and it's still actually an ongoing mystery of where they are now, um, mm -hmm. whether they're you know, lost under the ocean or they're you know, dug up and buried under some train track somewhere. Wow. It's a, that's a crazy story in and of itself. Um, but in the meantime, and very thankfully, uh, there were some really detailed casts that were made of all of these bones and tools beforehand. So, you know, we can still study the anatomy in limited ways. So, like, here's a cast of one of the skulls that was found here on the leftmost image that you can see. Um it's a little bit of a shame, though, because like there's still, like the isotope data that we could have gotten, you know, among other things. But the, and, and to, to my knowledge, I'm not sure if people have actually gone back to that site and looked for more bones. Um, I guess that kind of remains to be seen. Now, as you can see in the image at the bottom right that I have <laughs> photographed as best as I could for you, um, Javan and Peking Homo erectus are noticeably distinct hmm. in cranial. Morphology. Now, in terms of their geologic age, Homo erectus erectus is older, lived between 1 million and 700,000 years ago, while Homo erectus pekinensis lived between 750,000 and 300,000 years ago. So this is very interesting. Uh, I mean, like the Javan erectus, they have more robust skulls. Uh, they have more of a pronounced keel in the cranium. So it kind of gives them an almost kind of cone head triangular shape mm -hmm. when you look at them from the front. Now, Peking erectus looks more typical of what you see in Homo sapiens. You, you have a rounded cranial keel, for example. Um, the back of the skull in the Chinese fossils actually protrudes further back than the Javan fossils, while the latter has more of a thicker mandible than the Chinese remains. So yeah, you can see we have a lot of unique anatomy in these specimens, which has warranted their classification as subspecies. Um, not to mention their, their you know, one million plus year um, distribution in time has given them a lot of time to really kind of diversify and, and, and specialize in certain ways. So, you know, if you think, uh, if you think that modern humans are a diverse bunch, you know, we, we even for our short time span on earth, Homo erectus almost certainly surpassed that. Um, so, and of course I should mention that th these two subspecies are just the tip of the iceberg, mm. you know, depending ask there's something like six or eight different subspecies of homo erectus wow. all across uh, europe and, and asia um, and of course the folks who consider ergaster and georgicus um, members of this group that spans the range even more um, but again that's that's kind of discoursey so let's go ahead and jump to the next slide and move on from yep. that <laughs> ah homo naledi mm. another recent entry into the story of human evolution uh, i uh you know, there was a, another exciting and extensive 2013 to 2015 discovery. This is by the Lee Berger team. Um, in this case, this is from the Rising Star Cave System in Gauteng, South Africa. Now, I was in college. I, I was just starting my anthropology journey when mm. I heard about this discovery. I mean, it was so big that they had a live stream uh, <laughs> camera on the site that you could go online. You can actually see the excavation at work. Um, which was really fun. We actually watched some of that in class. Mm, mm. Now, the story is widely known, so I'll, I'll give the, the TLDR version of it. So you got a couple of spelunkers, um, Rick Hunter and Steve Tucker. They stumbled across the bones during one of their cave adventures, and then they alerted Lee Berger and company to investigate. Well, hey, we found some skulls and stuff. Come check it out. Uh, as it turns out, the actual entrance to the cave 
is stupidly complicated. I mean, at, at places, it's such a tight squeeze. And I, I mean, like, 18 centimeters wide. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> and at one point, there's a 12-meter drop. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's some, like, Super Mario level levels. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, given that most of the folks on Burger's team realized that they were just too big to really fit inside the cave, they actually put out a, a, an online call for anthropologists of, like, very specific dimensions <laughs> inside. Right. So that they brought on an all-girl team of six to come and actually pull the fossils out of the cave and to the surface so they could be studied. Now, over the, uh, the following year or so, you know, they, they went in and they brought out hundreds upon hundreds of bones. I mean, you can just see, for example, the table here on the right. Um, you know, it's a representative of about 15 individuals of various ages and sexes. And it was clear from the get-go that this, this was a new species. I mean, these bones were so different. So there was no, no doubt about that. Um, what was in doubt, of course, were the um, issues regarding its classification and its dating. You know, Homo Nalidi was quite a, an enigma. Now, you know, Berger's team noted that there were a number of anatomical features that could put this species anywhere on the family tree of Homo. You know, as far as cranial capacity goes, Homo Nalidi actually pairs up within the range of variation for chimps. Mm. So, you know, this is a, a small brain, but it's sitting in a cranium that's very reminiscent of later diverging Homo, mm. like Erectus, for example. The teeth are smaller than what you see in Homo, yet the uh, the molar teeth get bigger as they go back in the mouth. Now that's a trait that you see in Homo habilis and even in Australopithecines. Now you move down the body, the arrangement of the hands, arms, the shoulders, and the collarbones, that's telling of a species that is capable of a tree-dwelling existence. Mm -hmm. so that's a mode of life that's been kind of gradually lost through the rise of Homo. Mm -hmm. um, they're relying less and less on like going into the trees for resources and say habilis um now homo nalidi actually has an australopithecine like pelvis but the legs and feet are typical of homo erectus so <laughs> quite a bit of a mess here mm -hmm. um and that's the same thing of, like when the species lived you know the problem with finding fossil bones in caves is that they're often not deeply surrounded by sediment so you, you can't directly date them to any known stratigraphic layer. Um, I mean, you have to kind of find other ways to kind of sneak around that. Um, so in the meantime, you know, the, the, the sort of strange anatomy of Homo Lee caused the Burger team to kind of temporarily place it in an age range between two and one million years ago, just kind of based on the total sum of its anatomical features. Um, but in the end, you know, these mysteries were more or less resolved. Classification-wise, you know, when Homo Nalidi was finally included in a phylogenetic analysis, you know, it grouped with the erectine grade, mm -hmm. which means that many of the features, like those of early Homo, they might be plesiomorphies, for example. Um, as far as dating is concerned, there actually was enough sediment deposited along the bones to be used, and they actually did take a more direct approach. So, like, they, they took samples from the teeth and dated those. And they got a uh, date of between 335,000 and 236,000 years ago. Now, that alone made headlines prior to the phylogenetic studies. Mm. Yeah. And you had all these people that were going, oh, wow, look at this ancient-looking hominin that mm. somehow made it late enough in time to coexist with the first members of our species. You're right. You know, as if this was something that really made sense to biologists, <laughs> much less paleoanthropologists for that matter. I mean, you have to remember, there are no species that are more ancient than others. You know, like there are species with ancestral traits and species with derived traits relative to the crown groups, which, if you remember, they all survive in the present day. Mm -hmm. If you want to follow the logic of these articles, then you might as well jump up and down about chimpanzees and bonobos living in the present day. <laughs> right, right. So ancient looking, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, but, you know, that we know that Homo nalidi groups with the likes of Homo erectus, you know, now you know, that might make a little bit more sense to that particular crowd. I mean, yeah. Homo erectus lasted until about 108,000 years ago. So not really much of a surprise there with Homo nalidi. 
let's go ahead and jump to the next slide here. Mm -hmm. The last human that I want to cover today is Homo antecessor. This is one of the earliest hominins to have reached mainland Europe and leave enough of a trace to be sure that they actually were there. Now, this species was recognized as such during the 90s at a site called Grandulina in the Atapuerca Mountains of Spain. Uh, its classification history isn't nearly as convoluted as other hominins. <laughs> you know, the bones and tools on an earth, you know, they were recognized as distinct enough to warrant a new species name. And most everybody else was like, yeah, okay, this is, this is something different. Um, it became more of a question of how Homo antecessor was related to other humans. Uh, there was one proposal, for example, a sort of uh, anagenesis model, where it was sort of a transitional species between the Asian Homo erectus entering Europe and a normally European species called Homo heidelbergensis. And Homo heidelbergensis is a conundrum on its own, and I'll explain that in the next episode. Uh, nowadays, you, know, you don't really see this hypothesis around all that much, uh, you know, the phylogenetic work seems to place the species firmly in a branch position between erectines uh, and the uh, common ancestor between us and Neanderthals and Denisovans. Um, in fact, it was a really crazy recent study that managed to pull dental enamel proteins from antecessor teeth. Oh, right. And they actually plugged that into a phylogenetic analysis with other human species, and they basically confirmed that result. That's so cool. Like, Right before our common ancestor emerged, the uh, ancestor branched off. So it's a, a special place on the family tree. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the fossil evidence for this species is modestly good for its fragmentary nature. I mean, one of the best remains we have is the skull, which you can see here on these slides. Um, you have the, the fossils themselves on the right, and then them plugged into a, a, a sort of a plaster mold to kind of get the, a visualization of what the skull might have been like. Um, this is the, the boy of Grandolina, which was a juvenile who died when he was 10 years old. Uh, his cranium and his mandible uh, have more similarities to uh, the skull dimensions of more derived homo like ourselves than to any species we've met thus far. Now, what we have of the species postcrania, which consists of ribs, vertebrae, arms, legs, and feet. Again, they also closely match modern homo sapiens and, and their general kin. So that kind of gives us an idea that the the sort of modern human body plan that we currently have today was more or less established by the species origin, which would have been about one and a half million years ago, at least. So on the next slide here, um, as usual, I'll reiterate about hominin phylogeny and what we know at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, the most recent phylogenetic work, has, which you know includes Homo naledi, very recent fossils, shows these general relationships here. You know, Ergaster is the first to diverge, followed by Erectus, naledi, and Antecessor. Now, uh, I haven't even tried to trace the historical geographic distribution of these species, you know, like whether the ancestors of Homo ergaster arrived in Africa from Eurasia or not, that I alluded to in the last episode. Um, you know, homo species were most likely established all across Africa and Eurasia, you know, in this very large mid-latitude belt of mm -hmm. grassland and open woodland, um, which would have been pretty much the same across this wide range, save for the specific details. Um, so, you know, humans could move to and fro without realizing that they were moving between continents. So, you know, arguing which species emerged in what region is probably unnecessary. Mm -hmm. It'll be great difficulty to even try to find that out. So uh, let's go to the next slide here. Yep. Now, speaking of this mid-latitude belt, the climatic conditions that you know were occurring during the, the, the glacial period, which uh, we're talking about here, had actually begun to thin it out mm. in some places. And this was because of the just repeated expansion and retreat of these great glaciers that had formed uh, in the northern hemisphere. You know, by being constantly hit by periods of cool and warm and then cool again and then back to warm you know these regions are becoming uh you know very stressed and they had to kind of change in response to this sort of thing so for example the tropical forests in southeast asia actually started to recede and be replaced by tropical grasslands and this effectively bridged this region of the world to the shrinking mid-latitude belt 
and it made it easier for a species like Homo erectus to settle there, while simultaneously isolating earlier diverging species, like say the ancestors of Homo floresiensis, mm -hmm. into the pockets of remaining tropical forests that eventually led to, to Flores Island. Now, there was a general trend in the expansion of the temperate regions of the world in places like Europe and Siberia, and slowly but surely, humans were beginning to inhabit these places too. Case in point, Homo antecessor, you know, which you know, the environmental data from the fossil sites kind of points to their existence within a sort of warm, temperate woodland that was full of broadleaf trees, like uh, oaks and maples, for example. Now, in terms of hominin distribution, the Australopithecines were basically on their way out. I mean, all we had left was Granthopus robustus and Boisei, just clinging on in eastern and southern Africa, you know, while the genus Homo just continued to diversify and kind of take over all that space that they used to live in. Now, uh, Homo georgicus was still hanging out in the Caucasus region. Um, and of course, the, the patchy nature of the general human fossil record means that, you know, there's probably still undiscovered stories in places like India and West Africa where extinct humans had to have lived. Um, only time will tell. Uh, Albert, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, I don't think so. Alrighty. We'll go ahead and jump to the next slide then. Now, as I alluded to before, mm. direct teams were beginning to adapt to even more open environments than they had previously done. So uh, the savanna just seems to have felt as much as home as the open woodland that birthed the hominin lineage. And large megafauna were playing an increasing part in our diet. Mm. The general trends in our evolution point to a period when the modern human gait was fully established. So the head, body, and limbs were all contributing to a form of locomotion called long distance walking and running. Mm. Mm. Now, there was no question that we were now definitely obligate bipeds. Uh, you can take a look at these homo ergaster footprints here at the left. And you can see that, you know, without a doubt, this is a modern human foot. And the study of the trackways themselves testifies a modern human gait as well. Uh, in Homo ergaster, for example, the dimensions of the body became more gracile in form. We have long legs and a slender torso and possibly a slender stomach. Now, some anthropologists, and this is noticeably coming from uh, Leslie C. Aguilo and Peter Wheeler, they see this as a connection between the development of the body and the brain. Now, in their expensive tissue hypothesis, they point to an observation that the average cranial capacity of hominins grows extensively by the time we reach the genus Homo and onto the erecting brain. And, you know, it takes a lot of energy to grow and run a brain. You know, at rest, we burn hundreds of more calories a day than the other great apes. You know, just for comparison, that's 400 calories greater than a chimpanzee. And for orangutans, it's like 800 calories greater. Mm. So it's possible, uh, Aguila and Wheeler explain, that over time, hominins began to shift their energy more towards their brains than their other organs. And that would have included the digestive system. So when we reach the erectines, you know, we would find that the intestines have shrunk in overall size and the characteristic kind of big ape gut that you see in our close relatives would have been lost. Um, I mean, the dimensions of the skeleton itself seem to lend support to this sort of hypothesis. Now, incidentally, a small digestive system is typical of more carnivorous mammals. Mm -hmm. And this has led to these suggestions that not only were erectines consuming more meat in their diet, along with the vegetable matter of, their, of, the, of the area, but that they were the first hominins to actively hunt down big prey animals like antelope and deer to get that meat. Now the strategies used in power scavenging that we talked about in the previous episode would have been more than effective for organizing a hunt of this sort. The question is, well, how do you catch an animal like a deer? Mm -hmm. Well, as we'll see in a moment, erectines made and used stone tools like any other hominin, but these were probably not being used as weapons. Now, the ability to throw projectiles of any sort, and that goes from anywhere from spears all the way down to just 
rocks and some sticks that you find on the ground. You know, that's not out of the question, but it is more of a question of how well the shoulder and arm anatomy works to toss something a good distance. You have uh, anthropologists who argue that the arrangement of the shoulder wouldn't have allowed that, and you have others that say, oh, of course they could have. <laughs> so it's a bit of a discourse there. Um, actual wooden spears, um, which are used by some chimps uh, in a couple of documented cases. They go in the trees and they kind of pierce prey animals in little tree holes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they only go back in the hominin fossil record about 400,000 years. Um, and they're not associated with any of the arachnids. So like, we don't have evidence that, say, homo ergaster used wooden spears. Um, it's very possible, but we just can't be sure. Um, I mean, in any case, you know, creativity, that, that's a human feature. There's more than one way to eat an apple. <laughs> but you have one suggestion that has been pioneered, really, by the anthropologist Daniel Lieberman. And that's that the general build of an erect team facilitated the ability to chase down free animals and kill them by exhaustion. Now, compared to other large mammals, humans are terrible sprinters. I mean, we can only get going for short bursts before we get exhausted. Mm -hmm. I just know I can run a good distance, but after that, I, I got to sit down for about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, you know, whereas hooked mammals can just keep sprinting for much longer and at faster speeds. Right. However, we can actually match their total distance per day, mm -hmm. and that's thanks to endurance running. We can keep pace with other faster animals because we don't have to put all of our energy into quick movement. Now, as long as the animal can be kept track of, we can keep going as slowly or as quickly as we need to. You know, whereas this fearful prey animal is just going to keep sprinting and sprinting until it overheats and collapses due to stress. And when that happens and, you know, the humans can happen upon it, it you're basically near death and just take care of business. Now, we know about this particular behavior through the ethnographic record. Um, foragers from various regions of the world were and are known to hunt in this way. Um, there's the famous endurance hunt by the Bushmen of the Kalahari that was popularized in the Attenborough series, The Life of Mammals. Mm -hmm. so that's a very great sequence. Um, and today, like, they are generally used as a model for outlining this behavior. But we do have evidence of you know, indigenous Americans and Australians doing this too. Um, now this isn't to exclude other forms of ambush. Uh, going back to Augustine Fuentes in his book, The Creative Spark, he gives a couple other strategies that could be used for incapacitating large prey animals. You know, you drive them into ditches or you, you get them stuck in muddy water and then you can, you know, kill them that way. Um, however they did it, you know, erecting the appear to have been so good at hunting that maybe their impact on the environment had gotten increasingly severe, mm -hmm. more so than the um, Habilin groups could have done. Uh, there was a very curious 2013 study uh, by two anthropologists, Lars Werdon and Margaret Lewis. And, you know, it was learned that the large carnivoran population was, uh, you know, and that, that's, that's larger than... 21 and a half kilograms uh, in the Eastern African region, they went into a serious decline between the period of 3.5 to 1.5 million years ago. And that includes a lot of the big hyenas and the macaradons, so the saber-toothed cats. Um, these authors didn't find any data to reasonably suggest that climatic changes brought by the Ice Age were enough to kind of do these, these carnivores in. Mm. And so they were left to hypothesize that there was a possible ecological interference by humans. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that Homo ergaster directly wiped out these big predators. You know, I, I think there's no way that I can see that realistically happening. <laughs> um, instead, you know, we would have become so good at hunting larger game that we put stress on the hyper carnivores, while also allowing smaller species like wild dogs and cheetahs that have their own unique behaviors for catching prey to take on greater roles as ecosystem predators. Now, it's a, it's an interesting hypothesis, especially the conservationists, but uh, for me, I feel, I feel like more evidence is needed before we can move forward with that. Um, let's go on and move to the next slide here. All right. 
this is really fascinating. Mm, right. Our uh, new modern upright stance and the parallel growth of the human brain also played a very serious role in how we have our babies. You know, an expanding brain usually needs an expanded skull. And in humans, compared to other apes, this has reached critical levels. You know, by the time of the erecting raid, around 2 million years ago, the growth of our skulls had actually outpaced the growth of the birthing pelvis. And this made childbirth extremely difficult. Whereas a chimpanzee or a gorilla usually takes anywhere from a half hour to four hours to deliver a baby, human labor averages around eight to nine and a half hours. Mm. Now, some parents need a little less time, but others can reach the 17 hour mark and beyond. And that's full term. As an aside, I should mention, um, if a person gives birth a second time, then usually it takes you know, much less hours than before. Mm -hmm. but not always. Um, curiously, I, uh, I actually asked Madre about how my birth went. Oh, yeah? And she, <laughs> she's a very interesting case. For all three of us, you know, I, I'm the, the third, I'm the baby of the family. She actually had full-term deliveries for three and a half hours each. It was it was super simple for her. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, no no anesthesia or nothing. No C sections. Um, it's incredible. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you. Do you, do you know your your birth story? Uh, I don't recall. Uh, yeah, I I know little little snippets of it, but I'd I'd have to ask my mom to to be clear on all the details. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask her for this because um. Oh, she's, she's very proud of it, too, which is mm -hmm. kind of funny. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we have put so much energy into growing our brains that to accommodate this, you know, our brains are not fully formed coming out of the womb. They're only about a fourth the size of an adult brain. For the other great apes, you know, the brain is halfway through full size at birth. In fact, in terms of overall body size, the human newborn is like 1.3 kilograms heavier than a newborn chimp or gorilla. Mm -hmm. Now, keeping the brain at so early developmental stage, along with having the cranium unfused and soft, which you can kind of see here on the photo on the, the top right, and then requiring the fetus to actually rotate its head and body, you know, that combination of factors was really the only way for the newborn to pass through the pelvis without complication. Um, but sometimes even that wasn't enough. You know, miscarriages are very common for humans, perhaps more so than the other apes. On average, 25% of all conceptions end in live birth. And at least one out of 100 births are harmed because the fetus actually gets stuck inside. Mm -hmm. This is a phenomenon known as a dystocia incident. Now, because of all of this, it's any wonder how we managed to get where we are now. <laughs> Now, for one anthropologist, Robert B. Martin, the answer lies in midwifing, the act of assisting a parent during labor. For the other primates, birth is a pretty straightforward process. Uh, a chimpanzee, for example, when they're ready to give birth, they just kind of slink away and go into a secluded place to do so. It's just easier and less stressful for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the birthing process in general is easy for a chimp compared to us. You know, for the first hominins that seem to have started having difficult births, and these have been determined to have been species like Eargaster and Erectus, you know, it would have been almost necessary to have someone or maybe a few folks on standby to kind of help you through it all. You know, in an age without readily available birthing hormones or anesthesia, human widowifing, you know, would have involved de-stressing the process because you know, the longer a parent is in labor, the more stress accumulates. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a serious medical thing here. Um, the wives can also catch sight of complications. So like if a newborn does get stuck, maybe the umbilical cord wraps around their neck, which apparently happens a lot more than I, than I thought. Mm. Um, I, I had that complication when I was oh, born. Really? Mm. They had to go in and, un, and unhook the umbilical cord from my neck because I would, I would be coming out and then it would pull me back in. It's just back and forth over and over again. And then, right. Yeah. If, if that's not, taken care of soon, like that can suffocate the fetus. You're right. So I, I, I'm certainly grateful that it all worked out for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, like a midwife can go in and they can tackle that problem directly. Um, so the increase of problems that came with childbirth 
could now be mitigated with the help of family or friends, or just somebody who's in the know who's had babies before. Now, in the long term, community help would have played an increasingly greater role in childhood. Because the brain is in such an early stage following birth, infants require more attention and care than what we see in other primates. So from birth, the brain needs at least six or seven years to reach its full size. And then, and then it naturally continues to mature from there as the uh, neural connections are touched up, for example. Mm -hmm. so, a far cry from Australopithecine, and even Homo habilis. So in erectines, childhood seems to have almost you know, reached modern human time scales. So more time is needed to develop and gain the necessary skills for life. Mm -hmm. Now, in forager societies, as erectines would have lived, you know, everybody would have played their part in the community. And that would have included child care. After all, children need a lot of food and water, just like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that expression, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah, there's a lot of anthropological evidence to back that up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say that Homo erectus lived in villages. <laughs> but there's evidence from trackways and, and other sites to suggest that, at the very least, the hominid communities encompassed more and more individuals than previously. And so that means plenty of hands to help watch over an infant while their mother or father are away. Um, even going as far as to provide nursing for them when necessary. And all this attention would have ensured that children got everything that they needed, allowing them to eventually take on the role as caregiver too. Um, there's a lot of ethnographic evidence that shows that, you know, child care from older siblings was an increasingly common and, and vital thing in a community. So that's pretty neat, I should say. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and jump to the next slide now. Mm -hmm. Let's move on from our anatomical and reproductive evolution to more technological matters. Mm -hmm. uh, we come to the next leap in hominin stoneworking. This is the Ashulean toolkit. Now, these tools get their name, like the old one, from the site where their distinctness was first recognized, uh, Saint Ashul in France. Now, there's a very rough association with the erectine grade humans and the distribution and place and time of these tools. Uh, from the earliest reported finds 1.76 million years ago to the rather hazy transition away from their use before 250,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. We're still a little bit unsure about that and when like the last Acheulean toolkit was made. Um, but uh, along with some of the classic tools from the previous kits, you, know, you get the flakes, you have the one-sided choppers, you have the hammer stones. We also see clear innovations that make this really distinct. Uh, for one thing, you have two-sided choppers show up, you know, where the flakes have been chipped away on either side of the tool to create a sort of double edge for mm -hmm. mass use and well, chopping. And uh, we also find the first cleavers and scrapers, which are tools that enhance the ability for humans to clear off meat and skin from bone, or perhaps cut and shape wood. Uh, but the real poster children for the Australian toolkit are the infamous hand axes. And I have a whole selection of here in this engraving on the left that you can see for yourself. And they come in a wide variety of sizes. I mean, some are less than eight centimeters long, hmm. but they have these massive 27 centimeter things. Wow. And they're just found all over the place across Africa and into Western and Southern Eurasia at varying levels of abundance. Um, and these are relatively concurrent with species like Homo ergaster. So uh, we know like this particular species made Ashulian tools. Um, funny enough, as an aside, uh, the only place where there doesn't appear to be a strong overlap is East and Southeast Asia. So the homelands of Peking Man and Java Man, right? Um, we don't really find very much associated stone tools with these species. Hmm. Um, so it's actually been proposed by some anthropologists that maybe they were relying on other resources to make the tools that they needed rather hmm. than stones. Um, like shellfish, hmm. as, as we'll see in a moment. Now, the key feature of the Australian hand axes themselves and their associated tools is it's just a more heightened precision used to produce them. You know, hominin tool construction is based on our ability to pre-plan what we want to see and then construct it out of the rock hmm. of apes, where tool use is more situational. Now, in the archaeological record, there are telltale signs that these tools not only took longer to make, but the art of their craft was so refined that you can even make out specific styles that go unchanged in certain parts of the world. In general, the process of making a hand axe requires that you, you get a good-sized stone, 
And like the older one, the type of stone is determined by where you live, as well as how well it is to work with. Uh, for the Ashulayan, there's been a whole number of rock types that seem to work very well to make them. Uh, basalt, flint, chert, sandstone, shale, mudstone, adesite, among others. Now, taking a sturdy hammer stone, you have to strike off some of the really big flakes from your stone in order to kind of get it into that sort of teardrop shape that you can kind of see here. Um, and then the final lengthy process begins, where you're just striking the stone at numerous regions in order to kind of refine the shape and then make sure the edges are just nice and sharp. Mm. Now, even though these tear shop trait tools are called hand axes, and you can kind of see uh, how one of them may have been held in the image above, there is still debate on just what they were used for. Mm. Now, a lot of the smaller ones you know, could have easily fitted in the hand, and they would have been perfect for butchery and wood sharpening. And indeed, there's a number of sites that seem to support this. Um, the site of Kubifora, for example, in Kenya, uh, it, it preserves a vast area where a group of Homo irgastri lived. And on that site, about 100 square miles were all dedicated to butchering. It was a, it was a, a kitchen, basically, where the carcasses were cut apart and eaten. Uh, and then littered among the carcasses are some hand axes and other associated tools. And of course, there's experimental archaeology that kind of backs up their use as meat cutting tools, as an example. Now, other anthropologists have looked at some of the larger hand axes, which is these ones reaching 27 centimeters or more. And they actually had a really hard time seeing these used as, say, knives or axes. Hmm. Um, in particular, the archaeologist Stephen Miffin has noticed the fine symmetrical form of these hand axes and argued that their function probably had more to do with aesthetics hmm. and identity than cutlery, even going as far as to hypothesize a possible role in sexual behavior. Hmm. Um, I, I shit you not, like you craft this big, beautiful hand axe and it just shows how well you are at making things and that gives you an advantage when you want to meet your sweetheart. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Hey, look at what I can do. Come mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, needless to say, this is super controversial. You're right. Uh, th there is the discourse is strong on this front. Um, at the very least, the idea that the hand axes had something to do with aesthetics may hold some merit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to look really far in our culture to find well-crafted, pretty-looking kitchen appliances. Mm -hmm. So, who's to say that in making a meat cleaver, you want to make a really nice-looking meat cleaver? <laughs> right. So, I, I think that's totally fair. Now, the Australian toolkit lasted far beyond the erecting grade, I should mention. It was in use by later evolving humans, like the so-called Homo heidelbergensis, as well as the direct ancestors of Homo sapiens. Um, and, and, and during all of that time, from Homo erectus onward, you know, there were subtle changes that were made to these tools. But the overall form remained the same in order to include them in this toolkit. Um, but in the meantime, the erectines had begun to expand their tool technologies using new materials, which you can see on the next slide here. Now, the left part of this slide gives some notable first examples of this expansion. Uh, it's with erectines that we find the first use of shells as a type of tool, mm -hmm. at least for hominins. I mean, there are cases of non-human primates using shells to, to get food, but that's, a, that's an aside. Um, the figure here in particular comes from a 2007 paper that describes remains from Java, so concerning Homo erectus around one and a half million years ago. And these shells, which consist of various species of bivalves, so think about clams and oysters, for example, mm. these were being used as cutting tools on bovid bone. And uh, you can kind of see the telltale marks here at the very bottom of that figure. And you know these have been tested on experimentally and they've been shown like, oh yeah, these are these are definitely cut marks made by by clams mm. and oysters. Um, and so that, that's very telltale. Now on the right of that, you see evidence of shaped bone tools uh, here in the form of flaked mammal bones that were produced around 800,000 years ago by Homo ergaster. These are the first of their kind. Um, the barbed tips of this bone in particular, which is as it's been rotated, um, that especially shows signs of human handiwork. Um, incidentally, though, it, it, it appears to have been 
unfinished. That's what the authors uh, state. Hmm. Uh, we don't actually know how it could have been used. Um, comparing similar looking tools to Homo sapiens archaeological sites, maybe these could have been fishing lures. Hmm. Or at least uh, points on a spear tip that could have been stabbed in the water. Um, this is all speculative, of course. Um, in any case, you know, it's discoveries like these that are probably the tip of the iceberg in terms of the many technological achievements that erecting may have achieved before Homo sapiens evolved. Now, while the nature of the large Ashulean toolkit and their hand axes uh, as an aesthetic piece, you know, that remains debatable, there seems to be a, at least a lot less doubt on the recent rediscovery of some remains from the original Java Man site in Trinil. Among the non-human remains uncovered was this one particular freshwater clam here at the right hmm. that has some markings on it. Now, you, you might be able to make it out on the image on the top right. There, there, there's these lines that they, they kind of zigzag across the top of the shell. Now, when examining the shell, the researchers argued that these markings do not seem to be indicative of action trying to pry open the shell. Mm. It doesn't seem to be in a position where they would have been most effective. Instead, they propose that these sort of geometric markings are instead a form of aesthetic creative symbolism. Mm. If you want to be dramatic about it, it's a form of art. <laughs> now, that would effectively push aesthetic expression in humans back around 500,000 years ago, which is quite far away from the previously oldest forms of aesthetics, of course, produced by Homo sapiens in Southern Africa. You know, that Homo erectus was engaging in this activity creates a lot of implications for human evolution. You know, it is very likely that you know, there are remains of this sort all over the place that we have yet to be, we, we have yet to find, you know, unless they're made on perishable materials that have since been destroyed, you know, uh, bark art or maybe grass, grass um, weavings of some sort. Um, it's a very good question. I, I remember when the shell was um, was published, and, and we learned about it in college, and it was it was just so exciting, you know. Homo erectus making art. Mm -hmm. you know, that that was the big headline. Um, whereas art was supposed to be this thing that like humans did very early on after they had evolved, and it, it's. Again, another example of seemingly modern-esque behavior just showing up further and further back in time. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get Australopithecus africanus murals? <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> well, hey, let's uh, jump ahead to the next slide now because, oh boy, Ooh. <laughs> quite ironic. One of the most fiery discussions on human evolution concerns fire. All right. <laughs> So it, it has been so often considered one of the pivotal moments in our early history that, you know, we truly became something special when we tamed fire. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, among other things, popular culture has just overtaken this idea and use it in everything. You know, uh, I see commercials or, or comics sort of a caveman waving around a stick and lightning strikes <laughs> it and it's fire. And they're all like, ooh, fire. <laughs> And then things get interesting. All right. Of course, the classic example is 1981 film Quest for Fire, which is a <laughs> that's a fun movie to deconstruct. Mm -hmm. I have to do something with that later on. Um, one of my favorite classic films is a 1955 film from the Czech Republic, uh, Sesta du Praveku, or Journey into Prehistory, which I know I I've shared with you, Albert. Oh, uh, that's right. Yep. There's that one line in there which always cracks me up. You know. What a moment in history when it must have been when man lit his first torch. And when he first conquered fire, he became the lord of creation. Mm. That's how he became humankind. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's Shakespeare shit right there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it probably comes no surprise that things are much more complicated than that. Um, you know, there probably wasn't a single moment in hominin history when fire was discovered or, you know, that, that the first flame was lit, you know. Our ancestors almost certainly knew about and used fire even before we were hominins. Um, there's some really cool studies on chimpanzees, for example, that mm -hmm. have demonstrated that they have an understanding of fire and its uses. Um, during brush fires, chimps will 
stay clear of the flames, but also kind of keep a close eye on them. Mm -hmm. They watch where the spread goes and where it ceases. Because they, they recognize when small animals get caught in the flames. So then they can go enter the burnt areas and then pick out all of the crispy food to eat. All right. So simple behaviors like this, you know, which is all underpinned, by the way, by a, a switch from being totally afraid of fire to recognizing its power and using it responsibly. Mm -hmm. That could have very easily been used by early hominins, anywhere from Sahelanthropus and onwards through the Australopithecines and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, what about controlling fire for your own purposes? You know, the act of taking a sample of fire from burning vegetation and, and, and carrying that somewhere, you know, that, that would have certainly been a daring task for any hominin. Um, but following that stage, there shouldn't have been any real problems with maintaining it. You know, simple observation, fire requires fuel. That would have been more than enough to you know, have a hominin gather up some grass and sticks and set up a little hearth and keep the fire going for as long as possible while adding in new sticks here and there when the fire dims a bit. Um, now the road to making your own fire, that would require even more knowledge, you know, basic physics, for example. Um, well, this is more about luck, which is equally fair. Uh, but, you know, if you could make fire, then there's the potential for a needed resource, even without the need of nature's elements providing it for you. you know, then it becomes a really great resource, you know, provides safety and security, because again, other animals are afraid of fire. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's light for exploration. You go around in dark places or at night. Um, you can use it to harden tools of stone or wood. Um, and of course, it's a means to bring people together. I mean, goodness gracious, you know, who doesn't love a good campfire at night? <laughs> so uh, at present, we really can't put a date on just when these abilities took hold in the human lineage. Um, you know, it was probably more of a gradual process than anything. Um, at present, the oldest evidence of potential human-associated fires, so like archaeological sites where we know that fire was produced artificially and used by humans mm -hmm. versus, say, a forest fire coming in and sweeping over a human camp. You know, those come from sites like the Wonderwork Cave in South Africa, where about a million years ago, there were uh, rectines using Australian tools using the fire. Mm -hmm. And they were probably using it to cook their food even. I mean, you can see in the figure here uh, on the very, on the left, uh, these are bone fragments that have char marks on them that are very telltale signs of this behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding cooking itself, now we come to an interesting bit of discussion. You know, it, it may not seem like much, but the simple act of just cooking your food provides a boatload of benefits to your overall health and well-being. Mm -hmm. um, you know, besides the standard benefits, you know, making food essentially pre-chewed and thus speeding up digestion, cooking increases the overall amount of calories you'd otherwise get in raw food. You know, when it comes to added protein in meat, you know, there's a huge advantage. You get 33% more protein that can be digested from cooked meat than eating uncooked meat. And this is where the anthropologist Richard Wrangham comes in, in his now famous book here on the right. This is the 2009 Catching Fire, not to be confused with the, uh, the Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> Wrangham hypothesizes that it was the ability to cook meat, which gave our bodies the extra energy it needed to feed our already growing brains which if you remember were undergoing a rise in cranial capacity during the evolution of the genus homo now that is still up for debate because you know, there's a number of anthropologists who have found flaws mostly in the timing of everything mm -hmm. you know reagan proposes that the crucial period when cooking began to really kind of help us out was between 1.8 and 1.6 million years ago so that's quite a bit early for really concrete evidence of use of fire. Mm -hmm. um, that our brains are already increasing dramatically in size long before that time, um, especially in like Homo habilis, for example. So, you know, it, it might be that future discoveries just kind of help close this gap. You know, say evidence of hearts by Homo budolfensis, for example. Um, but until then, you know, this is, uh, it remains an interesting hypothesis and an area of research with some at least, at least some experimental evidence to back it up. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll have to kind of wait and see. So on the next slide here, um, I'd like to talk about the last subject that's relevant to this particular episode, and mm -hmm. that concerns language. Now, it's one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in the field of anthropology. We have absolutely no consensus 
on when and where language evolved in the hominin clade. Mm. And that's simply because language does not fossilize like bones do. I mean, written historical records certainly don't help. <laughs> and linguistics has its own fair share of problems regarding this topic and a lot of uncertainties. So one thing that must be made very clear uh, before we jump into this is the gulf between communication, so the exchange of information to others, and language, which is the symbolic code that facilitates communication. Now, in the latter case, language can be nonverbal as well as verbal. Now, there's no doubt that primates are great communicators. You know, it, it's one of the necessities of living in a social group. Um, some primate species have mastered this so well that other species can even recognize each other's calls regarding dangers in the forest. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're know, referencing the, uh, the West African case studies of the Diana and Campbell's monkeys, which have been richly studied. Um, they all forage together in the trees, and they each have their own calls for, oh, a leopard is coming, or, mm -hmm. oh, there's an eagle. Or, oh, there's a snake, and then all the other species in the area that can recognize that and then run for cover, depending on where they need to go. So, like if an eagle's coming, they can just run down into the to the understory, mm -hmm. or if the leopard's coming, they can run up into the trees. Mm -hmm. so, um, but language itself, that is very trickier to pinpoint in nature. Um, I mean, you have a couple of researchers who argue very strongly that you know the other great apes, even going as far as to include dolphins in the mix have their own languages but it's very controversial so at present we only are sure that homo sapiens today possesses this ability or language of this particular sort that we're describing um but like what do we actually know about the origins of language you know if there's no physical evidence in the rocks you know what can we even say about it well the best we can do is use what we know about language and how it works today and then backtrack that into prehistory to make some informed predictions uh, regarding the human brain, which is of course essential in language studies. Um, there are areas that researchers have linked to language processing. I'll give a basic rundown here and you can use my little image that I've worked up here on the left to kind of follow along with me. Now, when two people are talking to each other, the speech is first picked up in an area in the middle left side of the brain called Wernick's area. And that's named after the German physician Karl Wernick, who first studied it. That is where language is deciphered and thus comprehended. Then the neural information travels to Broca's area, and that's located more towards the front left of the brain. Again, Broca's area is named for the French physician Pierre Paul Broca. Um, if you're curious about his life, I recommend Cosmos for Possible Worlds. They mm -hmm. had a whole episode where they talked about that. Um, in, in Broca's area, uh, the response to the spoken information is then planned out. And then this plan is brought to the motor cortex at the top of the brain. And that sends signals to the areas of the mouth, the throat, and the lungs that produce speech. So from there, it's just a matter of having the right anatomy to create the complex series of sounds needed for verbal human languages. I mean, besides having teeth and a working tongue in your mouth, you know, down in the throat above the windpipe, lies a low-positioned larynx. This is the voice box. Now attached to the larynx is the hyoid bone, which helps the tongue move at its base and also kind of connects it to the larynx itself. Now notice how I said low-positioned larynx. Now other primates have a larynx, of course, uh, but theirs is positioned higher in the throat than ours. And this allows them to breathe while they eat or drink, which is something we famously cannot do. Mm -hmm as adults. Babies, on the other hand, can do so very easily. I mean, they need to be able to breathe while they breastfeed. They're able to do this as their larynx is in a high position too. And as they age, the larynx descends and the baby goes from being generally, you know, uh, babbly and chatty to being able to actually pick up on languages and speak. Um, so at some point in human evolution, the larynx you know, had to have shifted downward and changed the overall dimensions of the mouth and the throat to provide the template for which language could arise. So, okay, taking in the brain and taking in the throat. You know, what does that say about the possible time of origin within the hominin lineage? Well, regarding those specific areas of the brain, we can look at endocasts, which if you remember from our friend the Tong child, these are these sort of sedimentary preservations of the brain's shape within the space of the cranium 
like making an interior cast of your brain. Um, and you can also use cracks and holes inside fossilized, fairly complete skulls. And you can take your measurements and impressions that way. And what paleoanthropological research has shown is that a modern type Wernix and Broca's area can be detected within the skulls of habilines and erectines. So promising start. You know, the capability to, you know, decipher and plan speech was there in species like Homo habilis and Homo erectus. As far as the larynx is concerned, that can be difficult to observe. Now, like the brain itself, you know, the larynx wouldn't normally survive the fossilization process, but the hyoid bone can, and uh, provided it remains in the same place it was relative to the skeleton, that can give us some information about the throat anatomy of hominins. Hmm. As we've seen earlier, um, we have australopithecine hyoids, and they are they kind of show the larynx in the same position on the throat as in other apes. Mm -hmm. So um, very similar vocal capabilities there. Um, we don't have hyoid bones for hapolines or erectines. Mm -hmm. We do have them for more recent humans, like Neanderthals and their ancestors, and they show a position relatively like that of Homo sapiens, meaning that our modern larynx position was probably established within our recent common ancestor. Um, now, there is another more unique way to decipher larynx position. Um, research has shown a remarkably close correlation between the shape of the base of the skull and the position of the larynx within primates. Mm. So for living great apes, the base of the skull is flat, while the larynx is, again, higher in the throat. In Homo sapiens, the base of the skull is distinctly curved. Mm. Now, we have a fairly good number of skulls from a whole sort of assortment of hominins. So we can look at that and go through the family and kind of trace the possible movement of the larynx downward over time. Um, what we find is that in Australopithecines and other early hominins, the skull gains a slight curve. Moving on to Habilines, it's even more curved than that. And with Erectines, we find that the larynx is just low enough to provide a better capability for speech. Hmm. So we can Pair this with the cranial data to give us more confidence that erectines might have had language ability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, the particular arrangement in Homo sapiens and our nearest relatives, that provides really the sort of right mix of features that's telling of a very complex symbolic language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, perhaps we can speak about rudimentary language for erectines and fully modern language for derived Homo. Mm -hmm. as ourselves and in the end this is really the best we can do um i mean while all the information i've just given is i think is very important you know we still lack that definitive evidence right uh, you know, maybe there was you know more going on than we know currently uh, you know maybe the story of language is maybe less verbal than we might be thinking mm -hmm. i mean after all nonverbal languages are common today and in terms of communication, primates are masters of using gestures on their faces, hands, and bodies mm -hmm. to give information, which would mean that the first languages were probably more body languages than anything. You know, being bipedal, hominins are at a very clear advantage to use their hands in more complex ways, as we've seen in our increasing ability to construct tools or mm -hmm. collect certain foods. Right. Now, combine that with the usual ape noises, so mm -hmm. chatter and grunting and hooting and so forth, you know, that was probably the first stepping stone on the road to language of the sort we see today. So just to kind of conclude, you know, the erectine grade of human evolution brought ever more complexity into the world. You know, our, our communities were getting larger and more intimate. Our technologies were expanding. Our ways of thinking about things, much less speaking about things, were certainly changing too. And by now we were widespread across Afro-Eurasia. And as we continue to increase our range into the temperate regions of the world, uh, the ongoing ice age would give us more challenges that we could overcome. Mm. And so, uh, Albert, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, not too much. Uh, it's definitely a really fascinating subject, uh, definitely, and definitely one that I uh, wasn't aware of um, uh, much. And I guess in part that's because no one really is, <laughs> no, no one really does know much about the origins of language. And but uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of what you just said just now was new information to me. I, that's really interesting. 
Um, it does make a lot of sense that we would see at least rudimentary language in this uh, region of, of hominin evolution. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, it obviously would be very difficult to find conclusive evidence um, either way, but hopefully we will find uh, new ways of um, getting more insight into this subject. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of it, too. I mean, we have these fossils that we keep in our museum warehouses and, and, and other places for years and years and decades and decades and centuries, even in some cases. And we, we discover new technologies and how to study them. And then we can just go back to those old fossils and learn things that our ancestors would not possibly have thought about. Mm, totally. I mean, just look at you know, the Java Man case. You know, we find these bones all those years ago. Go back to those... Um, storehouse sites where they, the bones have been kept and re-examine some of those non-human tools and we find you know aesthetic art in homo erectus which you know th that was just sitting there in a museum, <laughs> in a museum you know storehouse I guess. all right so it, it's i know we, we reiterate that a lot but like it's just the importance of natural history collections mm -hmm. preserving them as much as we can and making them accessible to everybody all right well, in that case, if we jump to the next slide, you know, brings mm. us to the next episode and the first episode of Humanity, a prologue for 2021. Mm -hmm. if you remember, this will be kind of it for the year. Take a little bit of a break for the holiday season. Mm -hmm. In this adventure, you know, we're, we finally reached the most recent common ancestor with the lineage that led to Neanderthals and Denisovans and on the other side, ourselves. Mm. We'll tackle the taxonomic mess that is Homo hylobrigensis, <laughs> as well as a whole assortment of mystery hominins that have really complicated this part of the, the family tree. Right. And, uh, of course, the cultural achievements of these peoples will be further explored. I mean, with them, we do find, again, the first evidence of wooden spears, the increased use of aesthetic forms. You know, we have use of ochre and decorative ornaments, um, and perhaps the possible beginnings of belief in something greater than ourselves. Hmm. All this and more in the next year. Excellent. And so, yeah, with that, of course, uh, I would like to acknowledge our dear friends, Henry and Alicia, for both the music and the awesome color scheme on Albert's avatar. <laughs> and as a quick aside, I'd like to thank uh, Julio Lacerda, mm -hmm. who is a mm -hmm. wonderful paleo artist, who will, will be sure to uh, link his portfolio and in, in, uh, appropriate links. Um, I messaged him the other day because I, I really loved his recent artwork of those uh, homo eargaster engaging in um, endurance running after mm -hmm. that kudu. Mm -hmm. Right. So I want to include that in the show as at least a, uh, at least one um, reconstruction of hominins. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be amazed how difficult it is to find really good reconstructions of hominins available for creative commons that aren't, you know, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> that are accurate. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> So uh, I appreciate it very much, Julio. Um, I, I, I uh, hope to chat with you again soon, and um, I appreciate you letting us use the image. Excellent. And uh, with, with that, of course, uh, you can follow us on Twitter for updates. We are at Time and Clays. Of course, you're probably watching us on our YouTube channel, uh, where we have um, playlists for our lecture series. So if you want to catch the beginning of this one, as well as Albert's... Um, Dinosaurs, the second chapter, you're more than welcome to do so, mm -hmm. along with our usual news stories. Um, if you have any questions for us, feel free to comment or send us an email, timeandclades at gmail.com. Of course, for each description of our episode, we have links for references for this episode. Again, with human origins, there's a, a lot of cool papers you can sort through and look through. And uh, with that, yeah, I mean, again, we, we uh, this is it for 2020. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a small break and... Uh, enjoy uh, time with our family and friends for mm -hmm. the holidays and, uh, oh gosh I, I guess we'll we'll be back in january but i don't know when exactly we want to do that yeah um, well we'll figure it out but uh, we will be back in january <laughs> and uh, since that will be our first episode of the the year i guess uh, we'll probably do a news episode for the first first episode of the month and we will see where we go from there Absolutely. And we'll be sure to clarify this on, on Twitter later on mm -hmm. if we, once we figure that out. Right. But until then, thank you all so much for stopping by, and we hope you have a great rest of 2020, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Absolutely.